Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me welcome you all to this session. It's great to have you here, and it's great to have, uh, I see a number of familiar faces in the crowd to join this discussion with us to look at basically the financing and our future economy. This is a, admittedly a fairly broad topic, right? Financing economies, this can be, can be a lot of things. But I think in the aftermath of the financial crisis that started in 2008, and in the, in the middle of many current economic challenges that are becoming, that are threatening our economic growth of the world, I feel there's no better time actually for us to, to, to look at this, these topics, which is basically how we can invest in growth. To look at what exactly are some of the barriers we face today, and also to explore and brainstorm a little bit on some of the solutions. So to, uh, to have this discussion, we, we have an exceptional panel here on the stage. Um, to my left, we have Prime, Prime Minister Do Do Dobrovsky from Latvia. Good morning. And uh, uh, Ms. Wei Christiansen from Morgan Stanley, the co-CEO of Asia Pacific. And then Minister Bulif from, um, from Morocco. And finally, on the, uh, on the far left-hand side, my good friend Victor Chu, Chairman and CEO of First East Investment Group in Hong Kong. And in addition, we have our global shaper, Heather Ma, I don't know where she is, who is our inside reporter. And my name is Kevin Liu. I run the World Bank's investment guarantee business for Asia Pacific. So let's get down to a very specific situation on the issue of financing for growth. And let's look at Asia. Let's look at infrastructure. ADB estimated that there are 1.5 billion Asians that have, who have no access to decent sanitation, 640 million people have no access in Asia to clean water. 930 million have no access to electricity. And 7 out of 10 have no access to telephone in this region. So to address these needs during the decade of 2010 and 2020, the estimate is that every year we need $750 billion of investment into this infrastructure needs. But in reality, when I travel in the region, to, to many emerging developing Asian countries, you actually see a lot of unfounded infrastructure demand needs. So there is a problem between the need, a great need on one hand, and the lack of funding on the, uh, 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 on the other hand. But remember, Asia is a region with 37% of savings rate. So the money is there. The capital is there. It's not a region where people have mortgaged out their future for overconsumption today. Why we still have those financing not in place for this crucial need? And what are the barriers? Is it because that investors don't have clarity and they don't have the right information? Is it because the banks are too risk averse because of their own funding structure? How about the capital from the longer term investors, such as insurance companies and pension funds? Or is it because on the government side, that we don't have strong mechanism to prepare, prioritize, and package these needs into bankable projects that can actually attract financing. What can policymakers do to address this? And how can barriers for domestic and cross-border financing be addressed? So I have all these questions and puzzles in my mind. And with those questions, let me first turn to, uh, to Prime Minister on my left side. Um, Prime Minister, if you could give us an update um, about your country, about Latvia, in terms of where your economy stands, and how do you see the situation? What's the growth trajectory you see? And maybe comment a little bit on the financing side for that growth. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Well, as you uh, all probably know, Latvia was uh, very uh, seriously affected by a global financial and economical crisis in 2008, 2009. And at that time, uh, Latvia has been seen as a trouble spot of the Europe. Well, now uh, we can say that we have moved uh, on from the situation. Currently, we are fastest growing EU economy. Uh, this year, first half, we had a growth rate of 5.9%. Last year, we were growing 5.5%. So, uh, really, when we can see that we are out of the crisis and uh, seem to be uh, moving towards uh, also more sustainable developing paths. And so not only uh, 
world fastest growing EU economy, but also structure of economy is changing with more emphasis on uh, industrial production and exports, where we had on average some 10% of uh, uh, increase in industrial production each uh, year for last two years and 30% uh, increase in export for each year for last two years. So, but I think uh, one of the fundamental factors now moving gradually to this issue of uh, financing, while Latvia was able to uh, uh, achieve this uh, growth, was that we did the necessary adjustment early on, and thus we managed to restore the uh, confidence of financial markets. And uh, I, I think that's uh, very much uh, which was, uh, was important. Because if you have the confidence of financial markets, many things start to happen. Banks start lending to uh, your citizens and businesses. Your companies start investing again. Uh, citizens start spending. It's possible to attract foreign investment. And your economy can move forward. Whereas if you try to delay the adjustment, as also seems to be the strategy in certain countries, just the opposite is happening. Banks are not lending, uh, companies are not investing, citizens are not spending, and you are just getting deeper into a uh, recession. So I think uh, first and foremost, uh, if we talk about financing, it's about uh, trust between public and private sector. And in some cases there is this trust and there is availability of financing, and in some cases there is no trust and there is no uh, availability of uh, financing. Because it seems that uh, lack of the capital or lack of available financing is uh, probably not the main issue right now. Uh, if we look, uh, there are many uh, countries also in Europe, like Germany, like Netherlands, like Finland, paying tribute to the organizers of the forum, also Switzerland, where investors are actually willing to pay those countries to be able to hold their debt. And then there are other countries which just either paying some uh, crazy interest rates and thus having their uh, debt financing uh, unsustainable, or uh, private sector would not lend to those uh, countries at all. So it's really uh, very important if country can have the trust of financial markets and uh, from then uh, how the country then can finance itself. And another, uh, just on, a, on a general thoughts, uh, uh, if we look uh, to compare Europe and uh, USA, uh, another uh, difference, then, uh, now uh, moving more to the company financing, what we see, now the real bottleneck is really uh, bank financing. Uh, banks, for some reasons, are not willing to lend uh, to the real economy. And again, uh, not that uh, banks don't have the money. They are lending to, uh, they are willing to lend to each other really cheap. If you look at the inter, uh, interbank rates, they are willing to store money in uh, central banks even cheaper, almost for free. And uh, yet they are not willing to lend to the real uh, economy. So. Uh, what we need to look is also, especially in Europe, on alternative sources of financing. And one uh, uh, alternative source of financing which seems to be underutilized is equity financing. If you look at the capital markets or equity markets in the US, and if you look at the same markets in Europe, you see that uh, Europe is certainly underutilizing these possibilities. And for companies which now have difficulties to raise their uh, money in a debt market from bank financing. Uh, really, I think it's worth uh, exploring those possibilities for equity market and actually going for uh, IPOs or trading uh, extra shares or actually trying to raise uh, the capital instead of uh, debt. So those are probably uh, just some uh, introductory uh, remarks, but. Uh, uh, really, the general thought would be that there is no, no not necessarily lack of uh, uh, financing, but it's a lack of trust to bring this financing to place where it's needed.
Thank you, Prime Minister. That's an excellent point. I think, the, the, again, as you summarized, it, it may not be the lack of capital, but it's a lack of trust in the global system. And uh, in a sense, it's also re related to the issue of, of equity financing, right? In a sense, equity financing is a financing you are taking more risk, you trust the other side a little bit more than just demanding a fixed coupon, right? So th these, are, these are some of the aspects of the global financial system. But what about um, the, uh, this is a question for Minister Bulliff. What about some of the, pro we'll talk about the, the opportunities in the financial side. What about some of the opportunities and particular deficiencies of the global economic system, in your view? Oui, c'est vrai que, euh, effectivement, d'après le euh, Premier ministre, euh, il a énoncé un certain nombre de principes. Yeah, indeed, it is like uh, what you have described. But let me uh, first touch upon some other points. Well, everybody is aware of the uh, ongoing conditions of the market, uh, the monetary uh, conditions of our economies. In many schools and colleges and uh, campuses, we have learned a lot about the need to drive rational behavior. The choices by economies should be optimal ones. However, given the current state of the economies and the financial market, there is a lack of rationality. <laughs> Donc, euh, un marché financier, une bulle financière We have our très financial markets, et en face, on a une and, économie uh, réelle qui, de plus en plus, from time to time, there's a big bubble. Et en fonction de cela, and the real on economy is sliding while a financial bubble is uh, building up. Réelle, en fonction and il uh, y a there's a lack of uh, financing channels and uh, availabilities to fuel the economy because of uh, lack of trust. So, I think uh, the uh, behavior by many economies is suboptimal, is unreasonable and irrational. Take a look at the sports economy, a soccer player or a golf player. Un lauréat d'une grande école de commerce, la question qui se pose, est-ce qu'on valorise réellement l'effort Et dans ce sens, je vous pose la question à l'auditoire, so si vous avez un enfant que vous devez orienter vers des études plutôt supérieures, et vous avez en face un joueur like comme un Messi, je dirais, ou un autre, colleges, qui gagne 100 uh, fois le SMIC, voire même 50 à 60 fois le salaire, salaire d'un ingénieur sorti uh, d'une grande sports. école, Est-ce que vous allez orienter uh, votre enfant vers cette grande école ou allez-vous plutôt l'orienter vers le sport, vers uh, du foot, du tennis so ou autre do you want to send Donc your children to colleges est ce niveau. Est -ce or que nos uh, to uh, sont des football rationnels? fields or autre exemple, basketball courts au niveau de la finance, or golf courses? En bourse. So that's Comme irrational. Vous savez, il y a des and also let me talk about IPO, the public market, the listed market. Many companies have gone public through IPOs in the global economy. Some companies have over 100,000 employees, but the equity market is doing very bad. I will not give concrete examples. One of the companies has been listed offline. It is an internet company. Et en train de euh, faire des it recherches uh, et voir des de relations search, sociales. Uh, et cette entreprise a pour capital it pro, it le nombre media, de ces personnes uh, qui naviguent sur it le web. Et platform. forcément, son capital de 10, it voire 20 listed. milliards de dollars, ce n'est rien um, que vous, vous et moi. Et par conséquent, on se pose la question de savoir est-ce que réellement c'est un capital sur lequel il va falloir compter. Donc valuable? à ce niveau-là, je pense que effectivement, il va falloir revoir nos comportements. Le second high. volet de so mon intervention, I want to say our behavior je, is irrational at this stage. That's my first point. And for my second point, I want, I want to talk about the, the global economy. Au niveau de la valorisation nouvelle de, 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 du travail et au niveau même d'un certain nombre d'aspects tels que les aspects so, de spéculation. Right Et vous savez right que le mot euh, MAUX, c'est-à-dire l'un des grands problèmes 
you all de l'économie actuelle, c'est la spéculation. On spécule sur des prix, on spécule sur des indices, on spécule sur la spéculation d'un autre qui passe avant, et par conséquent, les lois du marché, on peut être aussi libéral qu'on veut, les lois du marché ne s'appliquent plus actuellement au niveau de l'économie réelle, mais aussi au niveau de l'économie financière. On nous a toujours appris que lorsque l'offre dépassait la demande, normalement, les prix, dans ce cas, devaient baisser. Et que lorsque la demande était plutôt excédentaire, là, les, euh, les prix devraient normalement augmenter. Mais il se trouve que l'économie actuelle, en commençant par les prix de l'énergie, exemple, les prix pétroliers, bah, l'offre reste quand même excédentaire, la demande est euh, en difficulté, mais les prix n'arrêtent pas d'augmenter, on est à 114-115 dollars actuellement aujourd'hui le baril. Donc la question qui se pose, si le marché doit réellement euh, prôner et être le plus important, nos comportements rationnels voudraient effectivement qu'on garde ces aspects fondamentaux du Mais il se trouve que personne actuellement ne peut être capable de prévoir ni les prix, ni aussi ce qui a deviendrait de l'économie et financière et économique et économie réelle, parce que les règles du marché ont été faussées. Et donc, il y a un grand, euh, une grande partie à gagner. Il y a beaucoup de financement à gagner. Si That's on arrive, si vous voulez, à se repositionner au niveau, de nos, euh, au niveau de, 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 de nos choix économiques, et cela permettrait, si je vous donne l'exemple seulement euh, du prix du pétrole, on est presque choice, tous d'accord que le prix moyen to, actuel, uh, en fonction de l'offre et de la demande, se situerait aux alentours entre 60 et 100 dollars, disons 80 dollars le baril. Si on prend le prix actuel qui est très élevé de 112, 113, on est en train de parler, si vous voulez, de gagner presque 30 milliards de dollars quotidiens, chaque jour. Alors, lorsqu'on sait que de l'autre côté, il y a un État comme l'Espagne qui est en train de chercher du 70 jusqu'à 100 milliards d'euros, que la Grèce, c'est aux alentours de 100 milliards d'euros, la France, pour gagner sur son déficit budgétaire, elle est à 30 jusqu'à 50 milliards d'euros. Et lorsqu'on sait que juste en travaillant sur un prix réel du marché du, du baril, on pourrait gagner du 30 milliards de dollars quotidiennement, je pense que là, on a des sentiers et des chemins pour réellement financer l'économie d'une manière plus saine. Et je pourrai par la suite vous donner plus de pétitions sur cette connotation qui pour moi est essentielle pour sortir un peu de l'analyse conventionnelle aussi des effets des marchés mais aussi des effets du marché. Je pense que nous pouvons avoir une analyse régulière. Nous pouvons aussi regarder. Merci, ministre. C'est une excellente série de remarques. Et mon take est que les clés ici sont rationality versus irrationality and the role of markets. You know, I think that's, that's key. When you, when you look at the financing for economic growth, you have capital on one side, you have the demand on this other side. What's in the middle is the market. If the market can be rational, and uh, then that, would, that will facilitate the, the flow from capital to need. So let me turn to Wei. Maybe Wei, if you can comment on the financial markets in China, the capital markets in China, what do you see? What is did it in order for these markets in the middle to play a bigger role to channel capital to, to, to the need of, of the economy? Certainly. Uh, historically, uh, banks have played a very important role in financing investment. Over the past several decades, uh, the role of the banks have been increasingly shared by various different other kinds of forms of financing, such as uh, equity uh, uh, markets, bond markets, private equities, and more. However, in many economies, uh, including in China, these other forms of financing are still at its very early stage, and uh, they are facing a lot of challenges. If you look at China, we know that the banking assets accounts for 92% of the total aggregate assets of financial institutions in China whereas uh, securities, insurances, and uh, mutual funds companies in total accounts only 8%. Uh, so this, this shows that the, the capital market is really at its early stage despite its 20 years of glorious uh, development and achieved a tremendous uh, uh, you know, track records, including becoming the number three 
largest stock exchange in the world in terms of market capitalization. Because this market, as we all know, uh, the first bottleneck, in my view, is that this market is still very much a retail market and really lacks the institution participation. We know this market actually is, the composition is 80% retail, 20% institution. And it's plagued with short-term speculative tradings. So I think no matter the initiatives of the regulators to introduce more sophisticated uh, products and to further broaden and deepen this market, without the institution base, that cannot happen. Therefore, I think it's very important that as the regulators uh, under the Chairman Gore's leadership at CSRC has been focusing on to introduce a fair and also efficient platforms uh, so that you can effectively attract uh, corporate uh, annuities and uh, uh, pension funds, uh, social security funds, housing accumulation funds. These funds, uh, if um, you know, done right, uh, they actually can provide a very well-balanced and structured portfolios and uh, with low portfolio turnover. And uh, of course, as a, you know, a foreign participants, we uh, absolutely believe it's important that the, that the Chinese market will provide access to firms like us. And uh, we are very grateful for the new uh, initiatives to allow the increase of QV, uh, because that's how we really participate in this market, uh, you know, other than obtaining an Asia license. Uh, for the foreign investors to, to, to have a flavor and access uh, to this market is largely through QFI. The QFI quotas, as you know, have been increased from 50 billion to 80 billion. And uh, we think that is a great initiative. In all these uh, different methods, I think in combination, over time, will hopefully uh, create more depth and also stability to this current market. Uh, the other issue that is uh, often talked about uh, and to reflect the deficiency of this uh, market is the lack of funding for SMEs. Uh, I'm sure you heard the speech from Premier Wen Jiabao yesterday. The government is actually very focused on that. Um, I, I think uh, no one now makes a mistake about the robust force that uh, how big a force that SME has become. Uh, they account for 60% of China's GDP, 80% of China's employment, and 50% of tax revenue of China. But at the same time, alarmingly, uh, most of these SMEs total number roughly about 10, billion, uh, 10 million, uh, only 3% have access to banking capital. So that's obviously something seriously wrong here. Uh, I think over the years, starting 2004, uh, you know, China set up this uh, SME board in Shenzhen, and five years later, they set up the second board called uh, Qinnax board uh, in Shenzhen, and, and, uh, which obviously helped. However, I think by and large, these SME sectors is underserved. But if you look at the other side of a coin, why do banks stay away from SMEs? It's not only the fault of the financial institutions, because these SMEs, we heard a lot of horror stories, we read about them, right? And the, unlike SOEs, uh, the financing cannot be collateralized, there is no government uh, guarantee, so what is critical about the financing is credit. However, in China, the current system is very difficult to evaluate the credit of SME. Even though in China we have a credit agency that's being created and they are very active, but they are very stretched and busy, and I'm sure most of them are not focused on SME. And more importantly, sources for you know, really variable information in China is getting more and more difficult. 
it's very difficult to even check the uh, balance, uh, cash balance of the company or uh, debt level of the company or record of litigation. Uh, and these kind of things or corporate documents, corporate filings at as AIC are very difficult to obtain. So therefore, we can't simply blame the banks for bulking at lending to SMEs. I think in order for the high quality SMEs to have a fair access to the financing, I think government needs to mandate a system for better ability to access information of SME. For instance, we need to establish a registration for lawsuits. And maybe government should give more license for private rating agencies. And the government needs to provide more access to corporate documents and top corporate filings at agencies like AIC. Because these kinds of measures are necessary for lenders and uh, also for investors to feel more comfortable. And also, as we know, because this is China, even though China has changed a lot, still contractual rights of the investors and also lenders sometimes get negatively impacted at the local level by political organizations, uh, or sometimes just because of the cultural effect. Uh, people simply do not like to see a corporation enter into a phase of bankruptcy. So therefore, I think there is a, it's very important for government really to empower the investors, also the lenders, to give them the power to cost effectively punish the dishonest SOEs and also negligent auditors or intermediaries. Thank you, Wei. I think you have a very valid point that in order for SMEs to actually have access to financing or maybe even more broadly for other parts of the economy to have the access to adequate financing, we need, number one, credible systems, procedures, and policies in place. Number two, fair and balanced platforms such as those funds you mentioned. And number three, responsible and possibly institutional investors particularly. So while we're talking about the investor, Victor, you are a very active investor in the region. So how do you see the opportunities and risk related to infrastructure space, for example? What can you do as a private investor in that space? Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, I think we are, uh, we are talking really a very crucial area uh, of the economy because everybody is looking for growth and uh, infrastructural projects, uh, and uh, particularly, as Wei mentioned, SME financing are key uh, to long-term uh, sustainable growth and indeed innovation. I think not just in China, but globally, financing for small and medium-sized uh, businesses are problematic. Uh, Wei has already articulated the problems in China, but internationally, we do have a problem about risk, ri risk weighting of uh, bank financing to small and medium-sized enterprises. That's, you know, Basel III, uh, you know, allocate the risk of lending to uh, unlisted SMEs almost as the same risk of lending to hedge funds and, and high-risk uh, um, uh, instruments. So certainly uh, that is not uh, very thoughtful and not very helpful. And when you have a massive uh, deleveraging on a global basis, um, the people who suffer really is the uh, are accepted the people the backbone of industrial economy worldwide that we need to support. So I think um, we need to look at this very seriously. I'm very uh, intrigued to read your article, uh, Kevin, at the FT that you, you circulated to us. I think one of the issues is um, we look, need to look at the problem on a holistic approach, not just looking at uh, bank regulation. We need to make sure that we um, provide more liquidity to these longer-term projects. And we need to look at, um, uh, for example, um, the rating uh, agencies, whether we can persuade them, not necessarily rating, a, for example, an SME, but look at, at the project. 
because a SME, because of the lack of uh, uh, very full information, uh, as we mentioned, or lack of transparency, or maybe the governance standard may not be as good as a multinational, but the project may be good. So we may be able to look at project rather than the company it itself. And in terms of uh, liquidity, um, you know, asset-backed securities, putting a, uh, a bundle of medium-sized uh, uh, PPP projects, infrastructure projects, into a portfolio, and then uh, securitize them. Now, that's happening in China, uh, which is very, very encouraging. Uh, Nanjing and four other municipality uh, in China are already putting together a portfolio of smaller infrastructure projects which are already income producing, no construction risk producing income, put them together in a, in a pool, securitize them and they have complete liquidity. Now these are the kind of uh, innovation we need to push more. But um, uh, the other area which I like to uh, suggest more is the PFI, the Private Finance Initiative. Uh, that was quite successful uh, during the Thatcher uh, era in the UK. Uh, small infrastructural projects belonging to local government does not always need government um, funding and government management, government design all the way. For example, if you're building a school or a local hospital or a local uh, police station, well, these are e public projects, but they can really bring the private sector to design, to finance, to manage. The government commit to use the facility on a, on a rental basis, let's say for 20 years. After 20 years, it's transferred back to government. Because of local government backing, they enjoy a much higher rating than they would otherwise enjoy as a pure private project. And therefore, banks are encouraged to look at them because they, it's almost a, a sovereign risk. Uh, these projects somehow has not really been um, promoted uh, very well uh, in, in this part of the world. And partly it's because you need a legislative frame, uh, framework. You need a statutory framework. But it, it's worth looking at because that's also providing opportunities for the private sector, particularly for the small and medium-sized private sector, to engage in PPP project with government backing to use the facility for the long term. And finally, um, it's very interesting. Talking to friends around uh, in, in, in the summer Davos and, and indeed in the winter Davos, I think big corporates on the whole are flooded with, with liquidity. Um, I think the top 1,000 companies in the world are sitting on a cash pie of over 2 trillion US dollars. And we're all looking for quality, long-term, sustainable return. So definitely for good projects, there are people looking for safe, long-term return. Also in um, China now with insurance companies beginning to, to become more active, people are uh, taking on long-term savings products. They will be looking for uh, investment products that will create long-term recurrent return because investment institution, uh, you know, the particularly the life insurance companies, they really should be investing not for maximizing return, they should be investing to meet their long-term liabilities. So these long-term infrastructure projects, big and small, by definition should be, should be uh, of interest. And finally, I want to um, again uh, say something about the, the role of MEGA, where Kevin, um, he may be too shy to to, to, uh, to talk about MEGA. MEGA, uh, Multilateral um, Credit <coughs> Guarantee Corporation, part of the World Bank system, provides political risk insurance for these in infrastructure projects, big and small, on a worldwide basis. And particularly when one is investing in emerging market, if there's a MEGA guarantee on top of it, it will make financing a lot, a lot easier. So I, I think the, um, uh, your 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 reach, your cry, crying out for a holistic approach really is the key to unlock um, um, the backdrop of a global deleveraging scenario that we have. Thank you, Victor. I think that's a very interesting take on the, on the holistic approach in terms of some of the critical elements we need in that approach. 
in, in, including the role of government backing to provide credit enhancement, including the role of multilaterals like us to use our balance sheet to actually credit enhance some of the projects, for example, as Victor mentioned, by offering risk guarantees. And uh, Victor, let me, let me, while we're talking about the role of government, and we're also talking about the long-term investors, let me, let me switch gear a little bit. And what do you think should be the role of sovereign investors? You know, we, in, this, in this region particularly, you have a lot of government-backed funds, government-backed pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, central bank pool of capital. Um, how, do you, how do you see, what are their roles in terms of, you talk about the government's role on the project side, to provide credit enhancement. How about the government role on the investor side? I think here we need to define what are we talking about because sovereign wealth fund is is a you know it's like private equity is is a big uh, description, you know are we talking about sovereign wealth fund like the Norwegian fund the CICs of the world or are we talking about you know Tamasex of the world they're, they're they're slightly different. If you're talking about the sovereign wealth funds that invest the uh, foreign reserves of a country. Uh, the CICs of the world, then I think they, for them, liquidity is key. You know, they, they will need uh, absolute liquidity um, because the vast, vast majority of, uh, of the portfolio is invested in, you know, high-grade um, fixed income instrument. So you need, what we need to do is do the packaging. We need to create a product which, at least on paper, will satisfy the liquidity uh, requirement and also on paper, we we'll provide the, the right investment rating for these sovereign wealth fund to invest. So they can invest in a fund which has been, you know, investment graded. So now there, I think what we can do is to try to persuade them to provide a larger allocation on their alternate investment portfolio, which in the CIC's case could be relatively small. But in terms of absolute numbers, these are huge, you know, and if, if that will help. On, on this kind of uh, infrastructure projects. Yeah. Yeah, Victor, let me, let me just challenge you a little bit on the issue of li liquidity. I think, yeah. I think I agree with you, liquidity is very important to, to a lot of investors because they may need their cash tomorrow to, to fulfill their liability obligations. Um, do you think there are also certain type of investors out there, whether they are sovereign investors or institutional investors, where actually because their liability structure is not that specifically defined, they actually have the luxury of going very long term. Therefore, they may be able to involve in, in projects which give them higher return, but less liquidity. Absolutely. As I mentioned, um, the uh, life insurance companies and some of the major investment institutions, they will be looking for long term quality, sustainable return, um, but high risk, uh, high, not high risk, but higher risk, you know. Um, they can, because they can structure the, the risk uh, uh, properly, but not sovereign wealth funds. I mean, not sovereign wealth funds in the, in the traditional sense of the word, right? Mm -hmm. um, but life insurance company, yes, and investment institutions like, you know, Thomas said, they can allo allocate a portion that can take a high risk. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. Yeah. Uh, while we're talking about liquidity, obviously one of the most liquid investments is the public market. If you're investing in public equity, you can liquidate your, 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 your holdings very quickly. So I have a question for Wei on that. And uh, how do you look at the equity markets in China, um, particularly the IPO process? Uh, is there anything we should do more in, in that space in terms of promoting a really um, a, a deep equity market in China? Uh, that's a very good question. You know, um, I'm sure a lot of you, uh, the audiences, uh, are all market participants and you have a first-hand experience of uh, interacting uh, with uh, the market uh, place, uh, players as well with regulators and with issuers, et cetera. I, I think this market actually uh, is, is very robust and has a lot of energy and achieved amazing uh, uh, results. 2,400 companies have been listed. Um, however, if we're looking forward, uh, there are barriers for more effective financing. Uh, for instance, you know, uh, wearing my head as an investment banker, we look at the IPO process, uh, which the process itself is actually rather unique in the sense of the roles that played by the government, uh, the regulators. I think in the early days, we understand the regulatory rationale because China 
is so inexperienced in the sense of having a lot of green uh, market participants without much experience, also have 90% or 80% uh, retail investors. So government needs to hold more hands, if you will, than the regulators uh, elsewhere. Uh, so therefore, you know, historically, that's the case. So even now, uh, I think that the regulators continue to play a very paternalistic kind of role in supervising and uh, regulating the market. I think it's time that the regulators started to think about the change. And as uh, Chairman Guo has uh, said uh, many times, and he's exactly now focusing on this. One of the things that, that, that I think they need to focus on is instead of looking at the profitability, the business model uh, of the company, they should focus more on things like protection of the interest of the investors and how to let information flow more, par uh, more openly and more accurately. So this current regime needs to be somehow reformed to become more information disclosure oriented rather than regulator um, making all the judgments on major elements of the process, including pricing. I mean, that, that way, the, not only a regulator, you know, shoulders a huge burden that is typically done and shared by the market participants, they get blamed if the company get listed and don't perform well. So I, I think this reform is uh, really necessary, and I'm glad that the regulators are thinking about it. I think this will change the dynamic uh, rapidly. Uh, because of the long queues that are waiting to, you know, for the companies to be uh, vetted uh, by the regulators so will be shortened. And also the supply and the demand of the uh, IPOs will be more market-oriented rather than uh, artificially adjusted by the speed of the approval process of the regulator. Thank you, Wei. I think clearly we will need some reforms and improvements for the, for the uh, Chinese equity markets, particularly the IPO process. Uh, while we're talking about reforms, um, uh, Mr. Bulliff, um, can you share with us a little bit um, the significant economic reforms uh, you, your government has been undertaking in your country, uh, particularly think of from an angle of, uh, we have talked about a lot of domestic financing, but we're, the other interesting part is overseas investor, right? If I were an investor here sitting here looking at Morocco, what can you tell me in terms of your economic reforms and uh, the improvements you have made recently? Oui, c'est vrai que euh, ce qu'il faudrait dire actuellement, c'est que euh, le Maroc. Euh, I would like to address this question in this way. Politically, socially, and economically speaking, Morocco is a very important country. It's a unique country as well. Uh, it is. Uh, in between the Mediterranean and uh, Atlantic is an Arab country. It's, uh, uh, it's part of the Arab world in northern uh, Africa. And at the same time, it's an African uh, country. Uh, we are only 14 kilometers away from Europe. So we are a bridge between Europe and Asia. And also, we are a country of Muslims. For the Arab world, we have 1.5 billion people in the Arab world, and we uh, assume a, a central location in the Arab, Arab world. And, uh, last year, we had the spring, uh, Arab Spring, which also affected Morocco. But Morocco was the only country to have achieved a smooth transition into democracy without any violence, uh, bloodshedding, or uh, casualties that other countries sustained in that transition. So that's a very important boost for investor confidence. 
We hope our uh, social, economic, and political stability will be an unrivaled factor to attract investment from the outside. And also, in terms of uh, some indicators of our uh, economic uh, performance, our competitiveness is quite high. Last week, Morocco was ranked three places to number 70 around the world. And in the Arab world, we also moved up our place by quite a number of notches. In 2017, According to a ranking in 2012, Morocco has ranked by around 12 points. In addition, we have a certain stability macroeconomic that remains very important. The system bancaire and financial Marocain is one of the most solid. If in the countries of North, essentially Europe and the United States, the banks have encountered a great difficulty. Ces trois dernières années, ben, il faut dire que les banques marocaines, avec les caractéristiques de travail, mais aussi de euh, les caractéristiques prétentielles, elles ont fait euh, des augmentations de chiffre d'affaires qui vont de 10 à 11 annuellement sur les cinq dernières années, mais aussi qui ont fait des avancées au niveau des nombres de clients et aussi on a fait une augmentation de l'ensemble des prix donnés à l'économie. Tout ça pour vous dire que effectivement, on a une certaine stabilité des banques, mais aussi cela nous permet de travailler sur des chantiers qui sont très conséquents. Le nouveau, le nouveau gouvernement, donc, qui, donc, euh, qui date de, de, de 7 à 8 mois. Ce nouveau gouvernement a ouvert un certain Our nombre de grands chantiers, que ce soit au niveau de l'infrastructure, que ce soit au niveau de l'énergie renouvelable. Nous devons, nous voulons so être le premier pays au monde au niveau de l'énergie solaire en 2020. Nous avons, on, nous avons engagé It des investissements a, très grands um, et là, c'est l'un des grands chantiers sur lesquels on peut travailler. Donc, pour résumer la situation, le Maroc, en étant un pays non producteur de l'énergie, et qui importe plus de 96%, les résultats macroéconomiques, les résultats économiques au niveau de la croissance sont les meilleurs au niveau de la région MENA, mais aussi au niveau de la région arabe. On a fait un taux de croissance sur les dix dernières années en moyenne de 4,8% de taux de croissance de PIB, et cela montre qu'effectivement, on garde au niveau marocain une grande stabilité économique, mais aussi des opportunités pour l'avenir, surtout qu'on a ouvert un grand chantier sur les stratégies sectorielles. Le Maroc travaille avec des stratégies sectorielles au niveau de l'industrie, au niveau aussi agricole, mais aussi au niveau de l'infrastructure globale et de la logistique qui va nous permettre d'être plus près au niveau des coûts, mais aussi au niveau des zones industrielles de l'Europe. Et là, cela représente une grande opportunité pour les pays européens, mais aussi pour les pays asiatiques. Et la Chine, normalement, c'est aussi un des pays qui de plus en plus s'implique au Maroc. Il y a un certain nombre de fonds souverains, puisqu'on est en train de parler de fonds souverains, qui sont prêts donc à investir, à venir au Maroc pour Thank you, Minister. That's a, that's a very comprehensive and useful overview. And uh, so I have the same question for the Prime Minister. Can you give us a two minutes update on Latvia economy? Thank you. Well, uh, as regards the uh, 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 situation in Latvia, I uh, already gave this uh, general uh, perspective as regards uh, uh, possibilities for investment in Latvia. Uh, certainly, we are now concentrating on more attracting uh, foreign uh, direct investment, especially in the uh, uh, production sector. And uh, I must say, uh, there are uh, some, uh, some good reasons now to invest in Latvia. I think Latvia is now a good place to invest. First of all, we have, uh, during the last years, achieved macroeconomic stability, financial stability, so our budget deficit this year is 1.9% of GDP. Next year we are moving down to 1.4. So uh, we have both economic growth and uh, uh, financial stability. Then, of course, it's, uh, uh, there are a number of other factors which matter. Uh, so while we were doing our uh, adjustment, we also do, did uh, many structural reforms to reduce uh, administrative burden, to cut uh, red tape, to improve uh, business environment, uh, to improve access to uh, infrastructure, to uh, improve access to different connections and so on. 
and uh, it all uh, seems to be working. Uh, our colleague already spoke on uh, uh, corresponding indexes in Morocco, so I can just outline the same in Latvia. So this uh, year we moved uh, uh, 10 positions up in a, a World Bank doing business index from a 31st to 21st place in the world for the first time ahead of both our Baltic neighbors, Estonia and uh, Lithuania, and now just above us are uh, Japan and Germany. But, well, our intention would be in the coming years to move to the 18th position in terms of ease of doing business. And as regards uh, World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Index, we also moved nine positions up uh, this uh, year. And uh, uh, among other things, we are still uh, uh, probably quite unique now in Europe that we are now working also on reducing taxes. Well, we had some tax increases during the uh, crisis. Now we will be gradually uh, decreasing uh, taxation, especially on labor. We have already flat tax, uh, but we'll be moving on personal income tax down to from 25% personal income tax rate to 20% personal income uh, tax uh, uh, rate. And uh, basically Latvia, in terms of tax burden, is uh, one of the countries with the lowest tax burden in EU 27. So I think there are many uh, good reasons to uh, invest in Latvia, stable macroeconomic environment, uh, good economic growth, uh, favorable taxation, uh, 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 good business environment, qualified labor, uh, labor so uh, come and invest in Latvia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Prime Minister. It's actually good to hear good news from Europe from, from time to time, and, uh, we, 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 which is not common these days. Let me o uh, open the floor, see whether there are any questions uh, from the audience for the panel. Can I go, to, go here first? Let's see. You, you go. Thank you. Um, my name is Lutfi Siddiqui. I look after a business line for UBS in Asia. Uh, my question is to, to you, Mr. Chu, and, and maybe anyone else who may want to, to answer. You alluded to the fact that international bank capital regulations uh, are onerous when it comes to SMEs and uh, uh, access that they might have uh, to capital. Uh, I would also contend that Basel III is... Uh, largely incompatible with the Asian context in, in many ways. Uh, as one group treasurer of a major corporate here told me, uh, you bankers and the regulators and your technicians uh, in a moment of extreme guilt have gone into a corner and come up with these rules, but the people who have to pay the cost is us, the, the users. The problem is uh, who should be raising these issues? Uh, the banks largely don't have the moral authority to do so. Um, the politicians, I don't know if they're technically competent to do so. What's the best way to make sure that the end result, which is availability of, of credit, particularly international lines of credit, remain in place? Uh, Victor, can you, can you hold, hold your response? Let me take a question, question from there as well. I'll take two more questions and we'll answer together. Yeah. Gentleman in the middle. Be brief. Huh? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm Sanjay Goenka from India. Uh, my question is to Mr. Victor. So you're talking about infrastructure financing. So infrastructure financing in roadways and port is very common, but you're talking about, talking about infrastructure financing on beauty basis probably in schools and hospitals. So can you please uh, explain this thing? One more there at the back. The gentleman at the back. At the back, yeah, one more. I'm from the NDRC and the newspaper under NDRC. Can you please assume that you mentioned is difficult so what about the debt to influence on SME financing? In addition, in terms of equity financing and debt financing, if you compare these two tools, is it possible that equity financing is more appropriate? Yeah, I'm very grateful to my learned friend from UBS for raising this. In fact, um, certain uh, forums such as the G20, uh, APEC, 
and uh, the International Chamber of Commerce, which represents private sectors around the world, um, have been working quite hard to, to push um, the global banking regulators to take a look at, the, at this issue as part of the global redesign of the architecture, you know, financial architecture. But I think in forums like this, if we speak out, and here, you know, we, two of us already spoken out, and people like yourself, that will actually, through the power of the media, uh, will attract attention. And, and actually, through the good efforts of some of the organizations I mentioned, there are revisions going on that uh, will help. But I think we could do more. And certainly, I will encourage you. Whenever you can, uh, we should speak out for, for SMEs. And for our, my, my friend from India, we're talking about uh, these smaller P PPP, public-private partnership, um, other than the Big Power Project or, or Toros, but smaller projects that local government look at as public project and therefore infrastructure, uh, even prisons, hospitals, schools. These doesn't need 100% government uh, involvement. In fact, history shows that if government is involved in everything, the design is not the best, uh, the, is all, mostly co will cost overrun and therefore delay, and the net result is probably better to leave it to the private sector. You create job opportunity for the private sector, but also private sector through a tender competitive project, we probably get a better project, better delivery on time, on, you know, within cost, but actually a better project at the end of the day. And these will also involve managing the project with facility, you know, facility, facility uh, manager. They'll manage the project for over long term, but at the end of the day, return to government. But government will guarantee to use those projects at a fixed return over a long period. And therefore, it makes financing easier because the government backing. Thank you, Victor. Wei, the question on SME? Yes. Um, regarding this uh, issue of SME funding, I think you're absolutely right because even with the proposals we talk about, that's not going to solve all the problems. But what will help is that at least for investors, for instance, I think that will facilitate uh, uh, their understanding and uh, their access to information and uh, build up the, uh, the credit uh, worthness of these uh, companies and uh, make it easier. So this is a, a right step towards the right direction. And uh, more importantly, I think, as you said, the government is doing many different things. Uh, one of them is uh, to allow these uh, SMEs to issue uh, high yield bonds. And we know actually that's already available and it become very popular. And also there are other kinds of uh, debt capital market instruments that are in the making and according to the press, uh, they will be launched soon. So in our view, uh, debt financing is very convincing, uh, you know, in the form of a bond are actually very convenient because as we know, most of the uh, bondholders uh, are institution investors. They are more sophisticated and they have a better way and skills in assess the risks. And uh, also I think in, in, in the instance of high yield instruments and that a high yield nature reflects the risk uh, that the investors are bearing and is, is uh, quite fair. And uh, in addition, uh, one thing we didn't talk about is shadow banking. Uh, shadow banking has gotten a bad name in the press uh, and in the Western uh, world. But in fact, if you look at what the, the, you know, the banking sectors has been doing, in fact, trillions of renminbi has been put into uh, the private sectors to, to fill the void and uh, provide uh, practical solutions to the lack of a funding problem. Uh, so all of these measures, I think, come in will help. And uh, to your last question about equity and versus debt, uh, we are often of the view that both are viable solutions to a company. Uh, no matter how small you are, you need to have a, 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 a really a right balance sheet and you need to have a, the right debt equity ratio. So therefore, you know, for different clients, they need to 
think about different instruments. And uh, I think the more these kind of instruments we have in the market and the products we have in the market, the better we are. Wait, thank you. Yeah, what I will do is that in a minute, I'm going to ask my panelists to spend 30 seconds each, only 30 seconds each. Think about if you are the master of the universe behind the global financial and economic system, what is one thing you want to change? The one top priority you want to change in order to enhance the capital to finance our, our, our economic growth. But in order to give you some time to think about it, let me take my 30 seconds. The way I see this session is that we're, we're looking at basically three pockets, right? We have the needs on one side, the economic needs for the growth. We have capital on the other side, and we have the markets in the middle. I think what we talk about on the, on the needs side, we do need government actions, reforms, to make sure people have the confidence in the system so the investors on this side can come in. On the investor side, we talk about sovereign wealth fund. We talk about long-term investors such as life insurers or, or pension fund. We talk about the needs for institutional investors. But the key is really in the middle. In the middle, in, in this middle bucket of financial markets, we, le we need, as Victor said, a holistic approach. We need equity markets that is healthy, including good IPO system. As Wei mentioned about, we need a complete debt market, including the bond project, a project bond market Victor was talking about. We need innovations such as PPP structure, where, where public-private sector can both come in. We need government backing and credit enhancement. We need the right procedures and processes, including credit ratings. And we need platforms for those capital to flow through. So that's my one-minute summary. And uh, let me go to Prime Minister, 30 seconds. What's your one change you want to make? Uh, well, if uh, there would be that kind of possibility, I think uh, uh, in a, a perfect wor world we should have uh, perfect information. So if anything, I would uh, concentrate on really uh, moving away from those risks of asymmetric information, which we have. I was talking in the beginning of the uh, lack of trust between private and uh, uh, public sector. It's the same basically within private sector. You cannot trust each other because you don't exactly know what's going on. And it's, uh, in a sense, uh, something also which uh, Wei was uh, saying that uh, investors need to know uh, more information in order to do right investment decisions. That's great. So, so supply I would rather go for this maximum transparency uh, and improve information channels between different investors to uh, increase trust and uh, decision making. Great. Transparency and information channels. Wait 30 seconds. For me, you know, operating in China, I like to see Chinese government continue to operate with total efficiency because I think that's a huge differentiating factor that the Chinese government has versus the other governments uh, outside China. Uh, it's because of this efficiency the Chinese government can really uh, weather through the uh, difficult 208 and also many other challenges. They have a lot of more challenges ahead, but with an efficient government, I think we'll be okay. So even more efficiency with the Chinese government. Minister? One change? Oui, certes. Moi, je vais rebondir sur ce qu'a dit notre well. ami de l'UBS, qui a parlé un peu de la moralisation et la responsabilité morale des banques, mais aussi la responsabilité... Talking about uh, the uh, ethics of uh, financial institutions, of banks. I like to echo with that point uh, very much, uh, and I think we uh, should uh, further pursue uh, mutualization and the interactions uh, between the uh, banking uh, sector and uh, the uh, uh, non-financial uh, uh, sectors. The uh, current uh, French government is talking about uh, uh, 75 percent tax rate for a very wealthy people. But uh, if that's the case, the richest people, French uh, people, would go to Belgium to become uh, Belgians. Uh, become Belgium citizens. So, therefore, between government and the private sector, amongst the triangle of government, private sector, and uh, banks, there should be uh, trust. So that uh, there will be a uh, good cycle. Victor, you have the, you have the last word. In the ideal world, Asia should have its own Asian benchmark currency. That's one thing we have not discussed today. So that the savings in Asia 
can be ploughed back into long-term projects in Asia. Unfortunately, the experience that we're facing in the Eurozone and Asia's largest economy, China, its own currency is not yet a free currency. I think that dream is still some years off. So Asia's common currency, that's a radical proposal. <laughs> Let me thank the panelists for, for their discussion. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.